uh, oh, and I have a website, but you will see my personal blog is not very active. So maybe I'm not the right person to speak about blogging, but I actually blog uh, at other places a bit more regularly than on my own blog. And um, as uh, Rebecca said, I visited South Africa uh, two years ago, and I actually gave a talk at LED's Cape Town about blogging. So at, at Saturday, I gave two very technical talks about package development. So I wanted to give a talk um, at LED's that would be less technical, but also uh, that I thought would be useful. And because blogging had done so much for me, like to help me uh, get opportunities and make uh, my voice heard. I, I thought that um, giving my tips about blogging, about promoting a blog um, would be nice. So that's what I did at LED's Cape Town. So here I am again, speaking about blogging, but also the technical aspect of it. So today I hope uh, to help you set up your blog, not only promote it. Oh, and I want to add this meetup. There were two other speakers that did explain how to set up your blog. Like Mary Christine spoke about setting up a blog. Uh, so why would you blog? So there, there can be several reasons. So maybe you already have a reason for coming today to hear about blogging. So I think if you blog that this can be no for future view. I myself sometimes go back to my own post to figure out how to do something. Maybe you have a patient for sharing and blogging can help you um, get opportunities. Like maybe if you blog about a niche topic, then if someone is looking for a speaker about this niche topic, they will think uh, about you, think of inviting you to speak. Or maybe you could get a job, I, I don't And uh, there was recently an interesting thread full of success stories of technical bloggers. So Vicky Buck is asked people to, to tell her if they uh, got some positives out of blogging. So that's an interesting thread to look at, to get some inspiration when starting a technical blog. And I think I'm teaching this because I'm a blogger, but I, I can promise blogging is not only a pyramid scheme. So there are actual uh, um, advantages of being a blogger. And why would you create a blog even if you don't want to blog? So I think it's important to have a platform to share stuff when you need to. So if you give a talk somewhere, it's nice to have a place online where to put the link to your slides, like really to centralize the content you put online. And it's also important if if someone is recommending you for a thing, so say someone is asked, oh, do you have any idea of a keynote speaker for this thing? And this person think, thinks of you and you don't have a website, that this person needs to write more you know, information about you, which is great, but it's also more efficient if you have a website that this person can give to uh, introduce you, or at least to complement uh, the introduction of you. And then, um, Creating a website is good for you. So my main topic today is a personal website because that's often how we would start. But once you know how to set up your own website, you can tweak it, tweak your uh, setup or use your knowledge to create a course website or an event website. So you can really create many websites and that's a really useful skills, especially this year where everything is happening uh, online and this year and probably next year too. And so what is a, a website? I don't think we need to know a lot about what is a website to blog. So if it's a static website, a website is a schema, which is a skeleton of the blog CSS for the styling and JavaScript for the interactivity. And if you uh, add a non-static website, which, which we won't see today, but say you create a WordPress website, then there is more machinery on the server side. And then to put your website online, you need an online server somewhere. But we will see today that it's, actually, uh, you can actually deploy a website in a smooth way without knowing anything about server. And why would you use our Markdown for blogging? So we are our users. <laughs> we are at the LEDs Meetup, so of course we all like R. So if you want to blog about data analysis with R, using R Markdown is quite a natural choice. So that's not the only reason why to use our Markdown. So of course, if you blog, blog about R, it might feel natural as well to use our Markdown. But then you could use R as a utility tool, even if you're blogging about something else, you could use an R script to generate text from some sort of structured data. And even if you use something else, even if you use Python, neither supports other languages, you could still use R Markdown. And what is an R Markdown blog? So in my opinion, 
so I have some criteria that I think are important when you create your blog. So I think it's important to be able to update your content from our markdown without having to copy paste from one place to the other. It should fit into your existing workflow or use something that you want to learn or an invest time in. So today we will see things that might be brand new, but you, but you can be curious um, about. Then I think it's important if you're presenting code to have some sort of syntax highlighting and I will um, underline that uh, again later. And then it's important for your website to look good on desktop, but also on mobile because so many people read uh, blogs on their phones, for instance. Then regarding what you put on your blog, uh, if you're doing something more scientific or you want to use references, it's important to be able to do that. Um, it's, it can be useful to be able to cite your post. So that's, that's if, you're, if you're a scientist, but, but it can be um, great uh, in other cases. If you want to use equations, you should be able to do that. And regarding the content, I don't think there is any limit to the thing you can blog about on your R Markdown blog. So it could be about R, but could be about uh, anything. And last criteria. So it's uh, good to make your blog accessible, especially like for instance, not especially, but for instance, for people you will use screen readers. So if you use pictures, uh, adding an alternative text, making sure that there is good contrast so that um, everyone can read your blog. So like not having text in very light gray on a white background. It's important for you to own your, your website. This depends on uh, what means you, you have, but on your content, if possible, having your own domain, but then maybe that's uh, too, too expensive, but like thinking about how you would still own your a blog, for instance, if you change jobs. Then if you want allowing for interactions between you and your readers, be it on social media or directly on your blog with comments, um, might be useful. And I think it's important and very possible for your blog to cost you little to no money at all, well, except for your time, which is not free, of course, but um, you don't need to pay for uh, a lot for having a blog. So today I uh, will do two demo, one of the seal, one of you go down and you, uh, you go down and you go. I will also mentioned the blog done package. And there will be, uh, after each of these um, sections, I will, we will have a five minute break. After that, I will mention a bit of uh, reproducibility of your blog post, how to promote your blog, and we will do some sort of um, debrief. And I wanted to show you the course website. So now where is it? Oh. Yeah, so this is a course website. There is all the materials from today. So we will only go from introduction to conclusions. So over th the other sections are more collection of links that might be relevant for you uh, and that I found uh, useful or that I should read. There are things that <laughs> uh, I haven't uh, read yet. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention, there is something here, a page called snippets. That's where I will copy paste some elements from. So. That's not, there will be no magic. Sometimes I will take text out of my snippets. Um, okay, and then we can start with this deal. So this still is both a framework for building websites and it's an R package. Um, and the definition of the uh, digital R package is that this field for our markdown is a web publishing format optimized for scientific and technical communication. So that's quite good for a technical blog. And I really like this stuff because it's uh, rather simple to, to set up and it looks great. So the package itself offers an output format for single documents. You could use a distilled format just for one document. It can help you set websites and blogs. So blogs are like websites, but they have blog posts. Because in this field, there is a difference between articles that are content that don't really have a date attached to them and blog posts that are not re-rendered automatically. And there are helpers in the digital package, like one for creating new blog posts. Oops. And uh, so what happens to create a um, website when you use this field? So your content is uh, an R markdown are uh, markdown files and you end up with HTML and this is done by the DCLR package, Pandoc and the DCLR framework. 
but you as user only uh, click on a button, the need button, or we will also see the build website button. So there is really a lot of machinery, which makes things smooth for us users. And now it's time for a demonstration and there are no closer demonstration on the crosswords that LA should more or less follow. So I hope everyone is sort of familiar with our studio or won't be too um, puzzled by it because I will do the demonstration in, in our studio. And because this skill is developed by folks at our studio, it integrates well with our studio. So to create um, a block um, with this still, the first thing to do would be to install this still with, which I have already done, but if you haven't, then you would start by installing uh, the package. Then we go to a new project here, in a new directory. And if we scroll down, there is a project template for, it, for this still. So we could create this still website or this still blog, and this is uh, what we're going to do. So I'm going to call it Jovi Distill, and I can change the title here. Um, beautiful new blog. So this is uh, how we start, and then we create a project. So it does many things to create the website. And then we'll open the new project. So it opened uh, a new R Studio project, and we can see here on the right that there are quite a few things here. So our, our project, an index file, and about uh, um, document, and this is a site configuration. This here is the actual website and these are the blog posts. So this will become clearer as we edit uh, things. And I said, this is a website, so we can open it in the browser. So this is the website as of now. So the only thing that's um, personalized is this, is the title I entered, my beautiful new blog. Um, so, if we go to the configuration, here we have the title. So we could change the description here, made uh, at a meetup. So we could change that. And I also want to change this parameter here before I forget. So I saved this. Um, and actually, I don't like this title because soon it won't be used. I'm going to uh, call my blog just a beautiful blog. So I've saved it and in my browser, it still uh, has the old name. So I need to rebuild the website. So when you, when, once you've created a digital website in the RStudio pane, um, here there is a build pane and there is this button called build website. So that's how we can rebuild our website when we change something like the configuration. So it opened the preview here, um, and here it changed the uh, title of the, of the blog. And there is a first blog post in the, by default when we created it here, this is a welcome blog post, and I want to edit this one. So here in the, um, so in our files, so this is a website and we, we never touch this directly. This is generated by this deal. So when we want to edit the blog post, we go to post and we go to the folder of the post. Every post will have a folder. So this is a welcome one. We go to the Armagon file here and this is where we can change things. And it's important that here we change the name because once you've written your own name in a, in a post, then for future posts, this shall we be, will be able to guess your name when creating the post. So I need this to be correct. Yeah. Um, and I think it might be nice to have some sort of plot to illustrate that you can draw plots with our markdown. So this is the only things I changed in the work compost. I changed my name and I added a plot in it. 
So this is the source of the website. If I want my website to be updated, I need to knit my blog post. So if I edit a post, I need to knit it again. And I do that with the knit button. And again, it opens a preview. So it opens directly a preview of the blog post. And we see that now there is my name here and there is my plot in the, in the website. So really, the, it's important in, in, in this year to know that your post will live in post, but, and then in the site, there will be the post too, but rendered for your website. So now I'm going to create a, a, a new blog post. So, oh, sorry, first I wanted to show that we could change, this is, an, this is not a post, this is an article because this is directly at the root of your website. And this might be interesting to have some um, presentation and it makes your, it will make your blog sound more finished. So this is my website and blog and I will talk about R. So I'm going to knit this. And this is a page that's here as about uh, for the blog. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to refresh it in the browser. Yeah, so in the, so this is a home page of a distilled blog. We can see my latest post, my only post and the about page is here. And I just edited it. So now say I want to add a blog post to here. So with this still, the way to create a new blog post is to use the create post function. And I can add a title. So in a very original way, I'm going to create to uh, call it um, my new post. We could add the author information, but this is going to guess it. Uh, and I'm going to let it um, choose today as a date. So now it, and you see that it opened a new file that lives here in a folder, my new post, and it has a date in the folder name, which is useful for um, finding your post source, but it's not important for the website. The date that's important for your website is this one that's here. And it guessed my name from, from my latest post. And now I could add some summary of my post and some content here. Um, so I wanted to, I, I'm going to add another plot in this one. No, no comma before the chunk name. Uh, and so this is very basic. So in, um, uh, in this post, I also wanted to add scientific references. So for that, Oh, sorry, where is my snippets page? Um, so to add scientific references, I'm going to add this sentence here, but I need to define the scientific references in a bit file. So I'm going to create a bit file um, here. And I'm going to save it in the same folder as my post. So as of now, there is no way to use the same. Well, you could save it uh, at the root of your website, but there is no automatic way to use the same bibliography file for all your posts. You would still need to say uh, which uh, bibliography file you're using. So I'm going to save it as reference.bib. So that's one, one thing. So the bibliography file needs to exist somewhere and I need to reference it in my YAML. So the YAML is this thing here. So this is the metadata of the post and the format of this is called YAML. Um, so now we find it. I hope it works. Yes, I have my plot, and yes, I have the um, 
the references at the bottom of the, of the post that have been uh, used for my bibliographic file. So in this post, we were able to use a plot, scientific references. I also wanted to show that you can use uh, equations, mathematical equations with LaTeX. I, I never, I never use scientific equations these days, but this can be very useful. So here I have an example. So I have added, so we can see here, this was, this was latex format and it's rendered to something nice uh, in, the, in the website. And the way it works is that it uses JavaScript, so MathJax to render the equations. So this happens, this happened in the browser. So I'm mentioning that because when you, um, sorry, there is a zoom thing at the top that prevents me from opening these things easily. So uh, no, this is still not my website. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to find it. Yeah, this is my website. Um, so if you look here, if I reload, yeah, so you might have seen that we first saw the equations in a, uh, that were ugly and then they became pretty. I'm going to do that again. So this is because JavaScript is loading. So this happens when you open the, the web page. So that's why the equation are first ugly and then they are rendered by JavaScript in, in the browser. So uh, another thing that we um, might want to use um, in Opera are footnotes and side notes. I'm going to show you how to use footnotes um, in our, uh, with this deal. So this is a sentence and the format for footnote is this. Um, so I'm going to put it to put a key. So this is a key of the footnote. And then I define the text of the footnote somewhere else. So I know this by heart because I use footnotes a lot in my own post. But um, these things are documented in the DSTL website. And this is common Markdown syntax for footnotes. So this is documented in a lot of places. So if you forget how to do that, then you can look it up. So this is a sentence and this is the text of my footnote. So this is a footnote. So we have the, the footnote here and, and with this here, when you hover on the footnote number, you can see the text and it is also at the bottom here. So in this case, it's, um, it doesn't seem that useful because our post is very short, but in a long post, it can be not that uh, smooth when you need to scroll down and then scroll up or even if you need to click. So just hovering to see the footnote text is a very nice feature of um, this tool. And another thing, so with this tool, you actually can write a lot of things that are not uh, the focus of your post because you can also add a side. And I don't remember how to add a side. So this is a good way, good occasion to go to the um, so this is a documentation website of Distil, which is a Distil website. And you can see that it has um, documentation about different things. You can add in Distil, um, including a site here. So aside uh, this um, syntax. So aside and then the end of the site. And this is here the side note um, of our post. So at this stage, we have set up uh, a website and you see that there is a bit of a special syntax to learn if you're new to Markdown or not that, that used to, use, to using Markdown. And you can, here you can create your content and add an about page, but our website still only exists on our computer. So I'm going to put it online. So for this demo, I'm, do, I'm going to do this um, in a very manual way. And when you do, when we do the second demonstration of Ubodon, I'm going to show another way of doing the deep content. So to deploy our website, what we need to remember is that our, sorry, this is here. So our whole website is in this folder. So the site folder is the thing we need to put online. 
Um, we can do that using the, using the Netlify website. So Netlify has a free, um, so where is my Netlify window, sorry. Yes, so this is my Netlify window. So Netlify has a free uh, version, so you can, and you can log in and Netlify with your GitHub account. So if you already have a GitHub account, it's very smooth to uh, log in into Netlify, otherwise you, you can create a Netlify account. So to deploy our website, we're going to use drag and drop, which I think is here from sites. So if we go down, here it says, want to deploy a new site without connecting to Git, drag and drop your site folder. So our site folder is called site. So I'm going to find it from, uh, so it was Josie DC here. Sorry, because I, ah. <laughs> Uh, I have this Zoom screen sharing thing at the top that hides a few things. That's why I'm so clumsy when things are at the top. So uh, this is a site folder. So I'm going to drag and drop it here. So now it's loading and it's creating my website. So it's online. So if you were to type this very long URL, you would find my website online. And I say it's very long, so this is a random domain. Thankfully, I can change it from, I was a bit fast. So here, domain settings, here options, and here I can edit the site name. So I could call it Josie Distill. And if it's a free domain, so if, it, if it hasn't been uh, used by someone else, like you cannot choose Josie Distill anymore because I own it. Uh, then um, it's up at this address. So this is a way to put your website online, which doesn't cost you anything and you don't even need to learn Git first. What the bit painful part of this is that every time now I want to update my Josie Adesso website, I need to, to drag and drop. Uh, what was that? So site overview here. Um, I am looking for the drag and drop here. So if I want to update my website, I need to go to the deploys page here and I will need to drag and drop it here. But this works like it's a very easy way to put it online for other, other people to see. And, and I, I've used Netlify, for instance, for deploying the website of this course. So I haven't bought any domain. And even if you were uh, to buy your own domain name, you could still use Netlify for the deployment. deployment. So Netlify supports custom domains. And now that we have a, um, a new URL, we're going to be able to, to add it to our site configuration here. So this is uh, the site configuration. We can add a base URL field and we can um, add our URL. And it rebuilds the website. So in the case of this field, your URL is important for here at the bottom because I chose the citations true parameter at the bottom of every of my posts, it will be this field that uh, tell people how they can cite your work. So it's especially important for uh, people that do scientific blogging, but I think uh, every, uh, maybe everyone could uh, want their post to be cited and um, attributed when they, when they are used. So now if I want to update my website online, I need to again drag and drop it. So I'm not going to do that right away because there are a few more tweaks I would want to, to do now. So the problem now with our website, so it's online. Um, it's, it has two blog posts, sorry. <laughs> but it's, it, it just uses a generic look of this. Yeah, maybe we'll like it and I think it actually looks uh, pretty great, but it's not uh, very personal. So thankfully, this still um, has. Um, sorry, I'm trying to wait. To... Hmm. So this still has a way to. Um, sorry, I know. What have I done? I can't find my Firefox windows anymore. So. 
And this still has a, uh, has a way for you to theme your website, which means to tweak uh, its, um, its colors and fonts and this kind of things. Sorry, I'm going to open it again in the browser. And if I look at the documentation of the distill website, which is a distill. So the documentation of distill is very complete. And at the same time, there are not many pages. So if you choose to use distill, I would recommend using uh, the, reading the whole documentation. So it, and it has um, all the documentation about how you can theme your website. And that's what we're going to do. So adding uh, something different to our website. So to create a new theme, we use a create theme function. And by default, it will call the theme theme. But, so I'm going to change it and I'm going to call my theme now. So what it does is that it create a file called, called mail.css and it contains variables about the, the style of the website that we can tweak um, to make the website look uh, more like something that, that, we, that we like. So I'm going to change only one thing. I'm going to make the title much bigger here. And so most of the name of the variable are quite self-explanatory. For instance, um, one thing I really like to change is the background color of the site header that is dark blue. So we can use either this thing, which is a hex code, or we can use uh, one of the defined colors. So I'm going to use black. So now I have changed the CSS, but I need to tell this still to use it. And for that, um, what it says is that I need to use this here, sorry. I'm going to put this. So you could use this theme for either one article or you could use it uh, and for your whole website. And that's uh, pretty often what you want to do because if you use it for your whole website, then it's used for every blog post. So here I'm telling uh, this still in my configuration file that I'm using this still and that I want to use a theme called mail.css. I'm going to save it and because I change the configuration, our studio is building my website um, automatically. So I'm. Oh, so there was a mistake, so I'm going to rebuild it. Not sure what happened here, but sometimes you just need to rebuild things. So now my blog has changed, so you can see that the nav bar is now black and the title is a bit bigger than um, what, it, what it used to be. So these are minimal theming, theming um, change and for and a way for you to, to end up with something you like is either you know, to read all these variables and um, play with them or you could use in the documentation of this still there are a few examples of websites um, which was uh, maybe in blog so I'm looking for that here so there is a gallery of different websites that were created with this still and themed with their this still uh, theme file and then if that isn't enough for you like if you want to do other uh, style tweaks you can um, do that as well and but for that you you will need to to use a developer console and i and i really wanted to show that anyway so in in your browser, I'm using Firefox, but it's working Chrome too. Um, you can go to uh, a category called deep, uh, web development because you have a website, now you're a web developer, so you can use this. So you can open the console. And this console is very useful for changing the style of your website and also to see mis uh, errors. So maybe sometimes here, if there is a problem, you would see some messages here. And this thing is called a selector and say, I want to change, um, I'm going, before I'm going to open, uh, so this is the title that is now much bigger. So if I wanted to change something here, to say, I want to change the color of this uh, author name. So first I would check that that's not something that's controlled 
Spicer DCL theme because that would be easier. But otherwise, I can play here. So I can see, for instance, that, uh, that this thing has a font weight that's uh, controlled here. So what if I make it um, 700? So now it's a bit bolder. And so the console allows you to, to change things, uh, like, but only for the session. And on the right, there is a button for copying uh, the changes you made. So I've copied, copied it. And I would create a, a new CSS file. Here, I would paste it, save it as styles.css. So again, I have a new CSS file, but I, I need to use it in my, um, uh, in my display configuration. So to do that, uh, I'm going to go to my snippets because I don't remember how um, to use this. So sorry, here. Ooh. Sorry. Okay, so this is what I was looking for. So now in, our con in, in my configuration, I have my theme, but I will add my own CSS. So I'm saving this and then rebuilding the website. And if I open a post, now my name is bolder uh, than what it used to be. There are already these two ways of changing themes, either using the theme file or adding so this is a theme file, or you could add your uh, CSS rules in, in, an, in another file. So once I've updated my website, I can put it uh, online again. Oh yes, which I have now closed. So sorry, I'm going to go back to the Netlify. So this deploys. Okay. So now my website online has my my uh, style tweaks. So this is the colors and uh, and and one last thing I I wanted to show with. The different uh, customization you can do with Netlify that are quite important is that with Netlify with Distil, sorry, is that you can change the nav bar here. So here I have a link to home and to about, and I would li like to add a link to my Twitter and GitHub um, accounts. So for that, um, I'm going to use this nav bar definition, but here, and this goes to my site channel. So for now, my navbar definition was this, and this is a default one, and I replace it. So I add a Twitter icon and a GitHub icon with the link to my uh, Twitter and GitHub um, accounts. And this comes from uh, this cell documentation. So now my website has a Twitter and GitHub um, accounts. So this is the, so and I, if I wanted this to be online, again, I would drag and drop. So these are all the things you can do with this still. So just to sum up, so we set up a new R Studio project. We got a default Dister website. We were able to add a blog post, and then we can change a few things with the colors and that part to make it more personal, to make it more usable. So depending on what you aim to achieve with your blog, you would put different links uh, in the that part. And also, if so, I added blog post. So, and if I wanted to add article, like the about one, I would use the create article um, function here. So, back to the slides here. Sorry, the demonstration. 
And so this still does everything you would need with an R Markdown block. So it's really feature complete. You can use R Markdown. You get syntax highlighting, which I don't think I showed, but if you have post and you set equal, equal to true, then your code looks great. It looks modern. You can use references. There is a small thing at the bottom to explain readers how to cite your post and you can use equations. It's, uh, it's actively maintained by people at our studio. So it's really actively developed. The first time I demoed this still a few months ago, there were a few things that uh, didn't exist, like the theming, for instance, and this uh, has been added since. So it, it's really actively developed and um, always improved. So are there limitations? So maybe the fact that your content lives at HTML might, might make it harder to migrate, but I'm not sure that's even a limitation. Then regarding customization, so you can customize the nav bar, you can add a few pages, you can change the colors, but you cannot customize it as much as you want, which might be a blessing in disguise then because you cannot lose or you know procrastinate a lot customizing because there is a limit to what you can do. But but right, but you can change the colors and um, nav bar, which is already a good thing to be able to, to tweak. So if you want to learn more about digital speed uh, resources uh, on the course website, the mainly I think the best resource about this still is the documentation website. And there are not many pages. So if you choose this already, uh, just take time to, to, read, uh, to read it. And if you have questions, comments, you can write them in the chat. And now we can have a small break. So I'm seeing the question about the reference format. I think maybe you could use a different CSL. So you know the file that uh, defines our citation format. So I will try that, putting a different CSL file in your configuration. So I haven't tried, but I, I think you can. So regarding the question about the theme and the style file, so maybe you could use only the theme file. So these are the built-in ways to tweak the style, but maybe there are things like, for instance, if you wanted to change the color of the links when you click on them, this is something that's not in the theme variables. So you will need to add the CSS rules. And for that, you need a style file. So 
for most customizations, you only need the theme file, but maybe um, if you want to do something more, you would mm -hmm. switch to uh, having a style file as well. And the material of my course was done using Hugo, not this steel. But you could build a course website with this steel without any, any, any issues. So end of the break. So it's all her demonstration. this. So uh, in this presentation, I will demo Yugodon, but then I will also mention another R package for using Yugo. So Yugo is a powerful static generator, and it's the one that is the trendiest in the R community. So it used to be Jekyll, but now we're all using <laughs> Yugo. Um, and YugoDown is an um, experimental and minimal package that's quite handy for creating a Yugo website. So Yugo, as I said, is a peripheral uh, site generator. It's also well known to be fast, which most often isn't very important for us uh, because we're not building. I mean, our blog is often not a gigantic website. And what's very important is that it's very easy to install. If you've ever used Jekyll, you might remember having trouble installing Jekyll and Gems and uh, and suffering uh, because of that, with Yugo, uh, this installation pains do not exist. And Yugo Learn uh, is an R package that provides an R marking output format that is compatible with Yugo and handy helpers for um, creating your website and creating new parts. It's very experimental, but at this moment, I think it's easier to start with than Logdom, but I will mention that uh, later I will, exp I will explain Logdom strengths. But right now, let's focus on Yugoton. So, from so with this cell, do remember there was only one step from HTML. In this case, there are two steps and two tools from so from our Markdown to Markdown, you're using Yugoton and also the Donit package under the hood and Pandoc. And then Yugo is doing the um, Markdown to HTML part. So, when you create a blog post with um, you go down, then you need to need, and somewhere you need to tell you go to build your website. Uh, and you do that with the need button, and then you have you go build locally or on the cloud. So Netlify, for instance, can build your website. Uh, so, late, so earlier today, I mentioned the importance of syntax highlighting. So what is syntax highlighting? Is having your code look better, which makes it um, I think easier to read. So this is code without any syntax highlighting. This is code with syntax highlighting with Roma, which is Yugo default syntax highlighter. And even better, with Yugo down, you get syntax highlighting for how we've done it. So what's the difference? It's not the same blue, but most importantly, here there is a link to the ggplot2 um, documentation. I didn't add it. This was added by Dunlit when I need my slides, which are made with Yugodon. And this is very handy for readers when they see a function in your blog post and they don't remember what it does, they can click and go read the documentation. 
and you don't need to add the things yourself. Uh, I have this meme, so with no syntax highlighting, syntax highlighting based on regular expressions, which would be what happens with chroma and highlight JS, uh, uh, JS, sorry. But um, what makes Stanley so powerful is that it passes your R code from R, so you can really know what, what is the function, it doesn't need to, to guess. Um, so when you uh, use Hibidon to build a website, you have the so Dunnit syntax highlighting for R and Chroma for urban languages. So when you're showing something that's in YAML and Shell, you get uh, syntax highlighting as well. So now it's time for a demonstration. I want to underline that in this demonstration, we're using a fork of uh, Yugodon that I made. I did that because the built-in function at the moment in Yugodon for creating a website uses an academic theme that is a bit overwhelming. So let me show you um, this uh, Yugodon website. So when you create a site with Yugodon, you can either use this function here or you can use a configuration article and tweak an existing Yugo theme. In my demonstration, we will use a function that is a bit like Create Site Academic, but that create a simpler website. So, um, so if you wanted to use my uh, function for the demonstration, so if you are great because that's really using a fork of an experimental package. So you would install this. So, so this is a fork I made to create this function. So then this uh, function is called, I think I have the documentation, uh, sorry. Um, So it's called create site vanilla um, and it, it will create a website and I forgot to write which version but with Yugodon you need to use Yugo and uh, Yugodon really pins a version of Yugo to your website which is important because Yugo changes and your website could be not compatible with Yugo latest version. Oops, sorry. So. So then you install Yugodon, but you also install Yugo. And that would be Yugo, which is one of the latest uh, Yugo versions. So really, because here R doesn't do other work, you need to install a package and then you need to install Yugo. So even if you were not using my fork, you will still need to install Yugo. So then once we've done that, we can create um, a new website. So I use my function and I'm going to create a little bit on Josie here. And so this is uh, downloading the existing Vanilla Bootstrap Yugo theme and doing a, a few tweaks to make it compatible with Yugo Town. So this is something you could do yourself with any theme. But for the demonstration, it's just easier for this to already exist. So it has created a new RStudio project and we can see all the files here. So it's a bit more overwhelming than when creating a digital website because there are more folders. So there is here a Yugodon configuration file. And what it states is what Yugo version needs to be used to create uh, the website. And so that's important for knowing with which Yugo version your website is compatible. And it has a configuration here. And this is a configuration for Yugo. And this is theme specific and it's in, in YAML too. Uh, for other Yugo themes, sometimes this will look similar, but this will be not YAML, but HAML. But in this case, uh, it's why go first, YAML here, YAML here. So we only need to learn um, one thing. So now how do we build our, our website? Um, so we, from uh, the diagram in my slides, part of the work is done by Hugo, so we are going to start Hugo in the background with the Hugo start function. And we're going to um, ask to render to disk. So here, and this is um, because Hugo is so fast, our website is already built here. 
So this is how the Yugo uh, vanilla uh, thing looks like. So there is, there is a home page, many blog posts already, uh, example blog posts are already existing, a page with all tags, an about page, and our, our RSS uh, feed is here. So we are first going to change the home page. So with Yugo, so we have the configuration. And all these things here you could just ignore for now, but the content lives in the content folder. So if we, if we want to change the about page, the page we're going to change is called about.md. So it's just an MD file, so if we don't need to use any R code, we can keep it as Markdown. So I'm going to change this and write, this is my new RDD job website here and you see that is that as the tactic changes and it's rebuilding the website automatically and here in the about page we see my new um, uh, new information so this is one thing but we are here to learn how to blog with our markdown so we're going to create a new blog post so if you remember with this still the function was called create post with yuga down is called use post like with the use this package. And it needs to know where we're going to put um, the blog post. And so with this theme, the blog post live under the post folder. So singular, not plural in this case. So I'm going to write here. And every post will leave it in its own folder. And you can choose the name of its folder. I'm going to call it with today's date because it's then easier to find. And I'm going to call the new RMD post. And it opens um, the new post. I can change the title here for something more. So my new post. And here I can use tags. So this is a blog post about the Hugo. And I'll leave this here. And like for with this too, we can really use our markdown and add some plot here and we can knit it. So we knit it. So this is something we need to, so changes in the R markdown are not detected automatically. So we need to click, but you go pick the changes that are made in the markdown version. So in our post folder here, we have our R markdown source. And this is a markdown file that is used by Yugo, and this has been detected automatically. So in the viewer here, there is our new post already in our website with our plot, and there is done its syntax highlighting. So here, there is a link to the documentation of the plot function. And because every post lives in one folder, if you wanted to add a picture to your post that is not a, an R plot, you would save it uh, in this folder as well. So already everything will live um, uh, in this folder. Um, so really this is, a, so this is a way you would create a post and you could also use LaTeX and you could also use refer, uh, references by following the Yugodon, um, document the, uh, documentation. So one thing I really wanted to mention is that, so with uh, use this function that I created, you could use a uh, uh, down create site academic function. There might be other built-in themes later, but one of Yugo strengths, but uh, is a Yugo theme gallery. So if you wanted to create your New website and you don't like the vanilla website, what would you do? So um, if you're using a built-in theme, these are easier for you. So if you are a bit on the fence, maybe just use this still or use a built-in um, theme, but maybe you have a, like a more precise idea of how your blog should look like. So what you would do is looking at the gallery of your theme. So this is a gigantic collection. You could filter by tags here. Or you could ask uh, Twitter for um, recommendation. What is important when choosing a theme is, so say, this thing here on the Iris theme, 
ads are looking whether it has the feature you want, of course, but also the date of the latest update. Because if it hasn't, hasn't been updated in a while, and there are a few bugs with the theme, uh, so maybe it's, uh, it's bad news. You should look at uh, maybe at this other repository, and you could look at the number of stars. This is an indication of how popular it is. This doesn't mean that less popular themes are not good, but it means that maybe there are less other people to ask uh, questions to. So say you select the theme, how would you uh, use it if you go down? So you would go to, you go, uh, so again, I'm lost. Where is the you go down documentation? So here, so you would go to this configuration page here and you would need to tweak the theme to make it compatible with uh, you go down. So that's, um, that would be the bit of the painful part if you don't use a build it theme. So in this case, we were using a build, sort of built-in theme from um, my fork. I wanted to show how we would tweak it. So an important thing when you have a Yugo theme is that unless you really want to take responsibility for the theme and maintain it yourself, if you tweak it, you need to tweak the HTML file in the layouts folder here, not the theme folder. Uh, and so I want, so this is a um, uh, head of our website. So I don't know if, so if we take this website, sorry. So one thing that may be important with your website is that it should look good when people post a link to your website on Twitter. And this is one thing I want to show you how to tweak uh, with our website. So if, you, if you're not a Twitter user, which won't um, tell you many things, but on Twitter, when you post a link, sometimes there is a nice card right up here. For instance, if I were to tweet about you got on configuration article, no, this <laughs> apparently wouldn't look good. So maybe if I could, uh, no, so, uh, so if I were to tweet about my website, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this, this isn't a very good uh, <laughs> demonstration. Yes, so if you were to, to tweet about GitHub uh, in your tweet, there would be a nice little card like that, so which makes it more uh, like that people are going to click a uh, link to your website. So how do you get this? So for that, I'm going to go to the, um, to go down, sorry, demonstration. So Twitter metadata, so this is a Yugo um, documentation. So Twitter, uh, may, uh, Twitter creates this little card for your website thanks to metadata that is in the head of your website. So for this, we need to, uh, to add this. So this is a Twitter cat template from Yugo. And we're going to add this to the head of our website here. So if we had this now to our website, and so my website has been rebuilt. So this is my website. Now if I look at the source of my website, so this is, so you see the content is a bit below, but in the head at the end now, in my website, there, there are these things called meta, Twitter card, Twitter title, Twitter description. So this is something that is um, important to, to tweak. So this, and the description is still empty because, sorry, um, we need to add to our uh, site description this. So I'm going to my um, site configuration. I'm putting this. Now, if I go back to my website source, no. So 
here now it says text about my core website. So when I put my website online a bit later, if someone puts a link to my website, um, it would look um, this, uh, this good. And this might seem a bit uh, complex for an example, but the idea is really that if you want to tweak and, and improve your website, I just use a Yugo theme, you might need to go read uh, Yugo documentation. So the way not to do that is not to use Yugo at all or to use a theme that already has all these important features like Twitter metadata or anything you, you would want. Now to come back to something that we have uh, already seen, which was how to change the um, style of a website, which we did with you go down. Sorry, with this still. So how would we, would we change the color that are our, our size of things on our website? So for this, we need uh, to change CSS. So we would use the web developer console again. And knowing the web developer console, if, even if you never tweak your website, it's just useful to know that it exists and that it can provide many information uh, about your website. So just good to know that, that it exists. I just manual <laughs> thing. You, are not, you don't need to, to know how to use it today. So say I want to change the color of the titles here. So I'm selecting them by clicking on them and I see that the color is defined here. And I want the color to be dark blue instead. So I'm, I've done that here. Oh, but it's on hover, so now they are dark blue when I hover on them. But I want them to be, uh, so this is the style that is for hover. If I want them to be dark blue all the time, I need to go here and change this to dark blue as well. So this has changed uh, the color in this uh, session, but and I here I have the modification that I have made, so I would copy them with my uh, and then the problem with making this CSS rules is that you need to figure out where to save them with the vanilla theme and my tweaks. This would go to this custom.css here, so it's. It's really just here for you to pass, paste your custom rules. So now if I refresh, this is still blue. So we have uh, this, um, this place to save uh, CSS edits. So, so when you have a Yugo done, a Yugo website, so as like a summary of this thing, you either like what you, what you get out of the box or you need to read documentation, the documentation of the theme itself. So where you got the theme from, there was some documentation. The documentation of Yugo, so when you really want to take control, and then some CSS tweaks. And really the level of customization you make means a different level of involvement in your website, different level of responsibility. Thankfully, there are a lot of Yugo theme out there that are nice and well without currently being to, to tweak them. So once we've done these things, our website is still not online. So we could drag and drop it to Netlify like, as we did with this still. But in this case, I wanted to show how you can do that with Git. So first I'm going to initiate a Git repository in my folder with use Git. So yes, I want to commit them. And yes, we can restart. So we have uh, now a Git repository and we're going to create um, a GitHub repository to go with this. So this is a use GitHub function. And for these things to work, you need to install the use this package and also to read the use this setup documentation. So you do this once for every no new computer you do. So that's a bit of setup pain, but that's only one time for your computer. So it's a bit um, slow for whatever reason. I hope it will end up working. So in the meantime, I can show you the use this 
don't. So if you use this uh, documentation, you have the setup documentation here, and you have an article about managing your GitHub credentials, which is crucial when you want to use, uh, use this to interact with GitHub. So if this doesn't work, <laughs> this, uh, this isn't good. So, hmm. so hopefully it will end up working. If not, the next step, oh, so it really seems to be frozen. Hmm. Interesting, so. So imagine my GitHub repository had been created, so often it works, I don't know what's happening now. So the next step would be to create uh, a Hugo down, uh, a Netlify configuration with this function. So this is just one function to run and it will tell Netlify what Hugo version to use. So uh, we would have um, a Netlify uh, configuration file, so it's still pushing. So, uh, so what I would do once my, um, once my repository on GitHub exists is I would go to Netlify here and I would create a new site from Git. I would go to GitHub here. Oh, that would explain. And here in all my repository, if all goes well, I would find my repository and I would link it to Netlify. Um, oh, and see it exists actually, maybe. No, so it's an <laughs> empty repository. So once the pushing has worked, from here you would link Netlify to your GitHub repository and you have to believe me, this would help deploy your website automatically. So today it doesn't work, but most often it works. Oops. So it's empty. I'm going to I'm going to push it by hand. So it that it doesn't work. We use this for one reason. So I'm going to copy paste this uh, here from the from the shell. Okay. I think that's here. No. So so by default, you uh, use this create a master branch, but this name. Uh, um, Used to be the default for Git, now we're all switching to main because uh, main doesn't have any reference uh, to slavery. So, so and I copy pasted what I got from GitHub. Okay. So now I have a GitHub repository with my website. Very good. So I can go to Netlify, create on this, and deploy my website. So what is the difference with dragging and dropping? So it looks <laughs> more complicated because I had a few issues with GitHub, but what's great is that now next time I make a change, so say I want to change my about page. So and just to show you my website is not online. No, it's not. Hmm. I do think it is. No, sorry, so. Okay, so because it needs to publish there, the public directory. Okay, so I'm going to make a change and I hope that's what works. So I have made a change. So I'm changing the source of my website locally. I'm going to commit it to GitHub. And push it. So I have changed my website, I have pushed it to GitHub and 
here at my website on Netlify. The team will have been picked up. So in this case, uh, uh, this failed. So deploy directory doesn't exist. So what is wrong with my um, so sorry, this is D still. Obviously, I'm making this mistake on purpose just to show you how to debug your uh, oh yeah, you know what? I said we should use Netlify file. Remember that? And I didn't run the function. So I didn't have a Netlify configuration. So obviously Netlify had no idea what to do with my website. So very easy fix, <laughs> follow the instructions. So we need this file add configuration. And just a note, when you have a problem with your view, you go and uh, Netlify deploy. Um, there is an excellent article by Alice Hill. So it's called a spoon of you go Netlify. So yeah, if you have like a trouble like this, uh, you can go to Alison website and read troubleshooting your build. So when your Netlify you go website doesn't deploy, you can read that. So um, so now it has been deployed. And I can see it online. So this is my uh, website. And you see it looks uh, very bad. And that's actually something that Alison mentioned in our, our post. So, and she says here uh, that we should change the base URL. And I think that's my problem. I think it looks that bad because no CSS is found. So I'm going to change the base URL of my website. So here in the configuration, there isn't even a base URL at the moment, or there is here. So I'm going to change it to the actual URL. And that's important because in the Yugo template, this is used to, to, to find where the CSS file lives. And because my CSS file didn't leave at example.com, then it, uh, it looked bad. So now it's building. A bit slow again. Okay, so now if I, yeah, so now it looks good um, online. So you see that with Yugo, there is a, there might be a bit more of guessing and reading the documentation so why uh, why bother? Well, because it comes with a lot of power, so many different themes you could use and a lot of uh, customization. So it comes at the cost of learning this, so it can uh, take time. But uh, for instance, I made this website with Yugo and I have my sites made with Yugo, so it can, it can be fun and uh, really powerful to use Yugo. So, uh, it's a demonstration here. So if you use you when you go down, you, you can, so we wrote a very minimal blog post with a plot, but actually following the documentation, you can also use references, you get syntax highlighting. If you choose your Yugo theme, well, it can look, uh, look great on, on mobile. So it's quite feature complete. Um, so it's a uh, a package that use, uh, for instance, for tidyverse.org. It's developed by Hadley Wickham and it's developed actively, but it, it, it should remain minimal. So what are the limitations of using Yugodon? Well, it's minimal. The function I demoed for creating the Vanilla website for playing is only in my fork, so maybe it will get merged, maybe, maybe not. Um, so if you want to use an existing theme that's more stable, so you should look at Yugodon documentation. You could use the academic theme, for instance. Now the limitation uh, is the fact that this uses Yugo as a static generator, so it's both the strength and the weakness. Yugo changes a lot, so it, there are many features added to Yugo, but it also means that your website won't necessarily work with the latest Yugo version. What's good is that Yugodon pins a Yugo version to your website, 
So you will still be able to use to rebuild your website just using an older version of Yugo and Yugo don't make that smooth. So you need to worry less about Yugo updates. And you might have heard of Blockdown. So there is Yugo there is also Blockdown and you can use Yugo with Blockdown. And actually what used to be limitation of Blockdown uh, don't, no longer exists, no longer has a default behavior. So you could use Blockdown to use uh, Yugo Dom, so and it has many features. For instance, uh, it defines a script called build.r for uh, running a script uh, to build, for instance, if you're making sharing sites, you could build them at the same time as your blog. And you could edit your website after building with build2.r, so really more custom workflows are supported. And the Blockdown book, so there is a old book about Blockdown, so this is great for getting started. The problem is that it's actually, uh, like not actually currently outdated, but it will be updated soon. So what, so what should you choose, Yugodon or uh, Blockdown? So I think right now it's easier, it might be easier to start with Yugodon because the Yugodon documentation is minimal and it's up to date with the Yugodon features. But I would really encourage you if you want to use Yugo to follow the RStudio blog. So that's, I think, rstudio.com blog. Because when Blockdown gets updated, there will be a blog post there. And then maybe you, want, you will want to, to switch. And um, when the Blockdown book uh, gets updated, maybe that would also make you want to switch. Or if you want a more custom workflow, you might want uh, to have a look at the Blockdown repository. Uh, I listed further resources on the course website, including links to the repositories of these packages if you want to follow um, their changes. Uh, so if you have questions or comments, you can write them in the chat and it's not time for a short break.
So, um, and of the gray. So I have a few more slides that are less, um, I don't, I don't include demonstration, but, but I mentioned important aspect when you have an R marketing block. So the first thing is about reproducibility. So one question and I, that I often ask myself when I start employing, I thought that maybe my blog posts would need to be needable forever. Like I would always need to be able to read them and that's not really the case. So, of course, it's important that your blog posts are sort of reproducible, like you want to be able to update your blog post in the short and medium term, if you not miss a mistake, if you have an idea of like one aspect from your analysis or so, and you, if you are demonstrating something that R can do, then you hope your readers would be able to reproduce your analysis well, except if you use private data, then they would need to change uh, the data source. But it's important that they can do the same thing that you do. Otherwise, your blog is much less uh, useful. But it's perfectly fine that your blog post will age. So truly, your blog post from three years ago would not work with maybe today version of Deplier, for instance. That's fine because your blog is not a current documentation website. So I'm wondering if you need, maybe you will need to renew all your posts for migrating to a new website generator one day. Um, but I feel, for instance, when I migrate my blog from Jekyll to Hugo, I did not renew my old uh, blog post. I used a Markdown file that uh, I've been needed already. So I use the rendered version of my blog post. But otherwise, you would need to play with some packages to transform the files. Uh, what if you want to have a post that never aged, like you're uh, really proud, proud of one of your blog posts that documents how to tweak, for instance, uh, ggplot uh, figure. Then in that case, you will need to be careful when there is no date of ggplot tool, you might want to renew your blog post just to see that it still works. But um, there is some limitation for you uh, to using your blog for that. Because your blog is not the vignette of a package, there is not an infrastructure for checking it, like there is an infrastructure for checking a package. Then what if you want to present a reproducible analysis, then you need to somehow have some uh, metadata about your computing environment, for instance, the version of packages you used. So in that case, you might uh, want to use tools for scientific articles. So maybe you can archive your analysis somewhere and in your blog, you would have um, a link to that. So for instance, to a binder project or something like that. So that would be out of scope for this course. But uh, a more like an, an, a more attainable thing is to have some transparency for you and for your readers. So maybe you want to add session information to the bottom of your post, so always saying which version of R, which version of packages you use. And if you are using data uh, from somewhere, then say where you got the data from so that people might uh, use it as well. And then I wrote common sense as a title of this slide because obviously I didn't, I never made any mistake linked to this. This is not true. So <laughs> sometimes I made a mistake link to not having what I now call common sense. So it's important to back up your website in different places. And if you are using the dev version, development version of a package, for instance, then write it down somewhere just so you could know that it was a development version of a package, not the version from CRAN, which is why it might not work with the CRAN version. Uh, then I will watch our antique, which I don't think we have uh, a lot of time for discussion, but when you create your blog, just have in mind like what is your goal like do you want your blog post to be evergreen post and to be valid forever or don't you want uh, or are you fine with their aging if you're not fine with your blog post aging then you will need to often uh, try to renew them so that's one aspect um i know i'm back to the topic of my meta but ali just came on two years ago so once you've created your blog post with this year, you got done our blog done. So you did this maybe as notes for you, in which case you don't need to promote it at all. But uh, often you blog because you want to interact with people out there. And for, and for that, you need uh, people to find your blog. So first, a very easy 
uh, step, an important one is to put the URL of your blog of your blog everywhere. If you have an RC profile, if you have a Twitter profile, you have a Gitter profile, put the URL of your uh, website in your profile. So then people can find it. So it's important to have no data. And that's quite an easy step. So it's a bit of a, you know, meager trip, go to your online presence everywhere, put the URL of your pretty new website in all places, in all locations. Then, um, so I'm a team member at our weekly, our which is a weekly newsletter that feature links to blog posts, as a link to R. So how do you get featured in our weekly? So there are two ways. So if you want to share only one of your blog posts, you could use a web form for submitting a blog post, or you could make a pull request to our weekly repository. Now, if you blog about R all the time, then what's better is to submit your RSS feed to our weekly, also via the web form. This way, every time there is a new blog post on your blog, then it will get featured in our weekly, and then it will reach more readers. There is also our bloggers. Our bloggers is different from our weekly because our weekly posts links to blog posts. Our bloggers republishes all posts. So you need a, an RSS feed with all the content and you can submit your feed to our bloggers. Now, don't take it personally if it takes time for submission to uh, validation of your feed because our bloggers is maintained by only one person, Tal Galili, so it might take time for um, and this person to have time to look at your uh, feed. So that doesn't mean your blog is bad <laughs> or anything. It's just that the maintainer of our bloggers is busy. Then if you use social media and you promote your blog post, don't, uh, so, you know, these days you have people spending a lot of time <laughs> on Twitter, maybe with doom scrolling, but also often what happens is people are looking at the feed full of information and you want your tweet to stand out somehow. So your tweet should be so I'm, I'm mentioning Twitter, but I suppose it works as well on other social media platforms. So you need your message to be clear. So write a clear text and don't be self-deprecatory at this stage. Put the URL to your blog post. Yes, we all often, you all for, we all from time to time forget to post the URL, that's bad. Then you can add a few hashtags, but not too many of them because otherwise your tweet will look like a bot. You could put an image if you add alternative text and then uh, in this way, this would be a tweet that, might, that will be informative about your post. Then uh, there is this word of uh, this concept of search and then optimization. Some people will find your blog because you have posted about a very niche problem that they have. So uh, you could read resources by marketers and one way to increase the page rank of your post is to link it to other places. So for instance, if you go to a discussion forum and answer someone's question about their problem, you could also say, oh, and by the way, I have a post about this very topic and this add a link to your post. Of course, if this is, if adding links is okay for the forum in question, some forums have different rules. Then how do you interact with your readers once you get readers? So uh, maybe you do that on social media. So if you answer your tweet, you could add comments to your um, website. So with this field, you can add, um, so if it's not already documented, it will be documented, so you can use utterances and you can do that with Hugo as well. This is a link to a blog post of mine explaining how. So utterances um, creates an issue in your GitHub repository for, um, each post, so that's where people comment using GitHub. So this is a lock-in to GitHub, of course, but this is a very lightweight uh, way to add comments to your blog. Then what if you get negative feedback and regard on Ali's meetup? So as we all know with Ali, sometimes there are people out there that are not very nice. So a very important thing if you get negative feedback on your blog is to rely on the support network. So uh, it might be the Ali's community stack, your Ali's um, friends from Ali's browser, uh, so that would be the first thing to do to have just people say, oh, I'm showing them that <laughs> this rude comment. And you don't, uh, and you absolutely don't need to respond publicly to someone that is a troll on your blog. You can just delete the comments and go on with your life. They don't deserve your attention. If you do want to interact with them, of course, um, oops, you, can, you, you can do that. Sorry. Um,
sorry, I got invited, <laughs> invaded by my kids. So. <laughs> so you don't need to respond to the negative comments if you do to uh, you do that not for them, but for um, maybe um, teaching other people. Uh, if you were wrong, of course, you should uh, apologize and do better next time. Uh, so if you work in science, you might want to create citations of your blog posts and for that, with this, here you have this metadata where people learn how to uh, cite your blog post. You, with Hugo, you might need to add a custom layout. And this is a link to a blog post where someone explains, Sébastien Rochette explains how he did that for his blog. Then uh, maybe you want to know how many people re read your post. So here it's a bit tricky because uh, maybe you need numbers, especially like if you blog at work to show your employer it's worth something. The problem is um, with this thing, if it's free, then you as a product or your readers as a product. So maybe you are okay using Google Analytics, maybe you are not. If you are not okay using Google Analytics, you might need to use something like uh, Matomo. So for instance, Matomo has a pay paid version where it's hosted or you could get it for free. But when I say for free, it means you install Matomo on your own server. So this means you need to know how to use the server. You need time, but not really free. So there's probably something, uh, some decision to be made to either use the free Google Analytics and all the data goes to Google, or you use something else, and then you need to spend a bit of time or money on this. And in any case, if you collect data, you need to remember about GDPR and read how you need to inform your uh, readers and how you need to uh, let them opt out of data collection. Uh, so that's all about analytics. Uh, so uh, as a question, so I, we're uh, near the end of this uh, small uh, course. So I've presented different things. So this still is perfect in the same that it's feature um, complete is not flexible. You cannot do everything you want with this here. You go and so when you use Hugo, be it with Hugo or Blogdon, is very flexible because you go, you can really define any layout you want. But for that, you need to learn Hugo templating or to find an existing theme that suits your need. Uh, using Hugo down, uh, you using a minimal and experimental R package. If you use Blockdown, it's more complete, but at the moment, like right now, the docs are outdated, but they will be updated like uh, between now and in a few months from now. So, um, so what would you choose? The easiest thing to choose might be distilled because it's uh, you need to learn less new things, but then uh, it might also make sense to use a Yugo theme that's built in a Yugo down or that you would tweak. So you find a Yugo theme that you like, and then you make it compatible with Yugo DOM using Yugo DOM docs. That's a bit painful, but this is only uh, one time for the whole website. Um, so when you decide to create a blog, you might start by playing with the two frameworks. Uh, like I, I, in particular, my demonstration of Yugo DOM was not the clearest. Error, so you might want to experiment yourself and just see how things look like and how it feel. And maybe does any of you want to say what they choose and why, or if any of you already has a blog, you want to share? No. <laughs> um, so in any case, no matter what you choose for building your website, it's very important to read the documentation. Often it's only a few pages and it's important to read them because it will save you a lot of pain down the road and to follow the development. Because there are packages, you could uh, see when there is an update on Cram, for instance, it's important because um, it might be a bug fix or a new feature that help you and also back up your website. That's very important, especially as you, uh, once you've blogged a few times, you really don't want to lose your content because you're proud of what you've done. Uh, if you change your mind and want to change tools, for instance, I used to have a blog in Jekyll and I use Hugo, so there will be migration tools maybe uh, if you uh, look for them in a search engine. There are uh, packages for editing the metadata of your post, and if you change the um, blog structure, it's important to add redirects for people not to, you know, if there was a link to a page before, it's important for people to not um, 
just uh, uh, end up at the NMT 400 for page. Uh, and what's important with blogging is that it should be fun unless you do it really for work. So, and if you're worried and if you think my blog posts are not worthy of being published and read by anyone, then maybe you could find a blogging buddy, maybe at Alice Johannesburg, that would read your draft and give you some advice and encourage you. And maybe you could do the same for them. And you should make efforts, of course, do your best. Uh, but you don't need to be perfectionist because it's a blog post. It's not, uh, it's not a book. So it's um, better if it's out there. Um, and the worst case, you could still improve it. I also want to like the setup is not fun. So in both cases with both packages that I've showed, there is you can click, you know, you create a new website and then you can use a function for creating a post but there is still this uh, need for tweaking colors and a few things, and just a need for learning the new workflow, for learning the name of the function. So that's hard, but I want to rely that uh, it's not fun for, uh, uh, so for most people, and you will get used to it. So after a few posts, you will get used to how you publish a blog post with your uh, thing. Now, some people like setup and I saw this um, tweet recently, so it shows, this is a graph showing the number of blog posts against the number of posts about elaborate blog setups. So apparently, unless you are superhuman, you either write, <laughs> maybe you write many um, blog posts, but if you really enjoy setup here, apparently you cannot um, write many blog posts, but I, I won't say that if you are here, so you really like elaborate blog setups, so maybe you can be the one teaching blogging with our Macdon the next time, so that's, <laughs> maybe something uh, for you. Now, do you need to blog regularly? You don't have to, so don't call your blogs a daily blog, then you can only blog, you know, three times a year because maybe that one blog post you write every few months will be the one that will be helpful for someone when you figure out how to do something. Even if it's niche, it can, it can help someone. And only write if you enjoy it. If you don't really enjoy writing, you can use your blog as a portfolio, as a news board only, you know, to to have an update when you give a talk somewhere, when you created a new package. So that can be one thing. Not everyone has to be a blogger. So um, thank you. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Adijan, for organizing and uh, Dr. Bebash for, uh, because I, she was the one with whom I was the most uh, in contact. So thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, and if you have um, any question, you can ask them now or you can open uh, issues in the website repositories. If you end up creating a website, I would be thrilled to see them. So you can tweet at me or email me the link to your website and blog post. Thanks, Mayel. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? So I, You're welcome. So, uh, yeah, so Netlify is, is, is free and unless you use it a lot, but for a personal blog, you, you won't, um, you won't need to pay or you could use. So in both, uh, website, this one, you go down, there is a documentation about using other things to deploy your website. So GitHub pages and Amazon web services. So there are alternatives out there if you don't like Netlify. Um, okay. So and if you have any questions. As uh, a very first example, now it was only desktop, but my website, so I'm really talking, this website is Yugo, that's why it might be confusing. I use Yugo more than I use Netlify. Vebash and Inger, do you, do you both have websites? <laughs> I will commit to, to making a website now. <laughs> <laughs> because now I know how and I have no excuse. So <laughs> I'll let you know when I have something set up. <laughs> and even some lab, our ladies' chapters are website. But, <laughs> but our ladies' chapters, of course, don't need to have uh, websites. Uh, mm -hmm. So how should we start for beginners? Maybe it's easier to start with this still because with, not because it's necessarily easier, but because there is less um, possibility for customization, so less choice, less decisions to, mm -hmm. to make, then it's easier to get, uh, it's like 
you have less uh, ways to procrastinate before getting started. And th thanks, Muna, for showing your, your website. <laughs> it's a, an academic website, right? That's very cool. Uh, nice, and uh, from uh, Diana, so the site and post folder are created by this tier. When you create a this tier website, all the folders are created uh, directly. Um, yeah, and, we, and I especially like in, the, in Muna's website, but it has uh, our ladies' students <laughs> in the now. I think I can stop sharing. And Gemma, if you don't create your website in December, maybe you can still make it your New Year resolution. So do it in January at the latest. Isn't the beginning of January still considered December? It's all sort of blended in together. <laughs> So if there is no new question, maybe we can wrap up. Mm. But ready, you can send uh, over questions via the course uh, repository, and I, I will do my best to, to answer them. Cool. Thanks for the person speaking yeah. French. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I Krisha, yeah, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I hope I won't be <laughs> by mistake. Cool. Okay. Thanks everyone for attending. It was very nice to see you all again. And um, thanks, Mayel, again. Well, thank you for, for the, the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Um, I, I'm going to end it in one minute. So, say hey, goodbye. <laughs> 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 Just <deep. laughs> Okay, cheers everyone. Bye. See you next time. Bye. Yeah.